It is my honor to be here with you today. Several months ago, Lorraine Doman Shade and I met down at the Capitol as we were protesting, and she said, you need to meet my pastor. And so then I came out here this summer, and Dr. Andy and I just had a marvelous time together. And back then, he was riding on the little cart for his, his knee. Um, some of you might know that. Um, and we just had a lot of fun together and felt that I had met another brother. So I want to thank Reverend Kelly and the music team for your music today. Thank you so very, very much. And you know, I, what is your name, sweetie? Rosa. Rosa. I saw you earlier, and I didn't know that you were the pianist because I can't see you. So <laughs> I don't want you to think, she was like, oh, she's kind of off standard. She was talking to her, but she didn't talk to me. So anyway, I, I just want to say that. Um, and, and Mary, Dr. Mary, thank you so very much for how you opened the space for us today. And blessings upon the life of Mary Oliver. There is something in the human DNA that causes us to have this proclivity toward adoration and praise and worship. We express it in lots of different ways. Some of us with our favorite sports teams. <laughs> and our adoration in, for some might even show up in our bodies, in the colors and whatnot that we might wear. For others of us, it is entertainers. And for others, it might be our loved ones, or the deity of our own understanding. But it's in our DNA to adore. How that gets expressed varies across culture. But it's in there for all of us. And on this day that we celebrate the life and the work of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Many people adore him. And many of us have a need for spiritual leaders who we adore, who inspire us and who challenge us, who guide us. And Dr. King was one such person. And you know, there are people who pay good money to go hear certain spiritual leaders speak. And, and there are millions of people around the world who go simply to receive a hug from Amma, who is known as the hugging saint. The Dalai Lama is one who people adore, people around the world. And he has confirmed that there's a young boy born and raised in Minnesota who is the next incarnation of the Buddhist leader. This young Tibetan boy, Jalu Dorje, at age four months, it was recognized there was something distinctive about him, and Dalai Lama has affirmed that, and he is being trained to understand the awesomeness that is his. I can only imagine what that is like for young Jalu to grow up knowing that he is adored. How does that shape someone's life? Now, unlike Jalu, most of us did not grow up knowing that we were adored. Now, I don't know your life story, but I can tell you, I felt loved by my parents, but the moment 
Actually, I didn't even have to step out of the house. I had a brother who was five years older than I. He had been the baby for five years. He really did not like my coming on the scene. (laughs) There was no adoration at all from my brother. And when I went out into the world, there was even less adoration for me. I was taught to see myself, perceive myself, move in the world as small. And every time some bigger aspect of myself started expressing itself, people would say things like, who do you think you are? The queen of Sheba? And perhaps like Jalu is thought to be the incarnation, I think the eighth incarnation of this particular Lama, maybe I am the incarnation of the Queen of Sheba. (laughs) The question is, what am I going to do in this incarnation? About 20 years ago, I was in church on a Christmas Eve. And as the congregation and I were singing, Hark the herald angels sing, glory be to the newborn king. These words were whispered in my ear. The angels sang when you were born. So having been raised Pentecostal, I said, no, they didn't. (laughs) They only sang when Jesus was born. And then the Spirit spoke those words to me again. The angels sang when you were born. Hearing it the second time, I began to take that in, and as I did, I could no longer sing. I could only weep. I fell into my seat, for I could no longer stand. This was one of those transformational moments in my life. The angel sang when I was born. That day was very similar for me many, many years earlier when I was just 13, 14 years old and I was in a worship service for youth. And in good Pentecostal style, there was dancing and praising and adoration, Pentecostal style, and I stood there and I felt Nothing. Good Pentecostal girl that I was, I immediately assumed it was because there was something wrong with me. There must have been some sin in my life why I could not feel this exuberation, exuberance, an exhilaration that others seem to share in. And that night, as this young teen, I went out of the church because I couldn't bear to stay in anymore. And when I went outside, I looked into the dark night that was filled with stars. And as I looked at those stars, I felt ushered into the presence of God. I felt one with God. So fast forward another, however many years that was, I'm I'm a lot uh, older than I look. I know you think I'm about 35, but anyway. (laughs) That wasn't funny, but anyway. (laughs) 
So the night that I heard the angels sang when you were born was another one of those life transformational moments. Being out in the stars as a 13-year-old transformed my life. For there I began recognizing I can experience and I can adore God in lots of different ways. But then when I heard at age 40, the angels sang when you were born. That was another level for me of engaging with God. And so, I think because of that experience I had as a young teen where the stars spoke to my heart so powerfully about my oneness with the cosmos, I've always loved stars. I moved from New York, New York City, to Arizona a couple of years ago, in part because I needed to see stars. And now, rather than live in New York City, I live in Fountain Hills, and I get to see stars. And every night, I'm transported into the oneness with spirit in ways that the concrete buildings just don't do for me. So just as it is in our DNA to adore, to praise, to worship, it is also in our DNA all of the elements of the universe. All of that that is in stardust is within us. The hydrogen, the carbon, the oxygen, Those same elements that we celebrate in nature are not distinctive from who you and I are. And hydrogen of those elements is the most abundant. It comprises about 75% of what there is in the universe. Hydrogen is what fuels the sun and the stars and us. And are there any farmers in here? Or people who do gardening? People who work with fertilizer? A couple of you. So you can share with your your friends here the power of hydrogen that is present in manure. Perhaps you've heard of manure that is stockpiled, that because of the power of the hydrogen in it, every now and then, it can spontaneously combust. Yes, sister, you did it. Do that again. (laughs) And sometimes, is, is this okay for me to say in church? Sometimes there are people in our lives who have stockpiled stuff. I didn't go there. Some people have stockpiled stuff, and and, and if they're like me, for years I spent my life wanting it to look all neat and pretty and thought I didn't have any you-know-what. And so I would push it away from me and stockpile it. And every now and then, because of the life force in the hydrogen, do that again. (laughs) And when that happens, people wonder, why is all of this stuff flying on me? What did I do? Well, you see, there is a kinetic energy 
in the hydrogen. We get to choose if we're going to stockpile it and it spontaneously combust, or if we are going to repurpose it and use it as fertilizer. So, those of you who, who might be like me, who have told yourselves that you don't have any stuff, or if you smell something and you assume it's somebody else's stuff, I urge you, sisters and brothers, to recognize it is in all of our DNA to have stuff. And what is really important is what we do with the stuff. Because there is a power in the hydrogen It is that which fuels the universe. So here we are, each of us, within our DNA, hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, and other key elements. It's when those things come together. when they go through the process of fusion, which is the coming together, it is the merging, the melding, the intermingling, the synthesizing, that's when amazing things happen, is in fusion. Now, most of us have been taught in Western society that our value is contingent upon how well we are able to handle the issues of our own lives by ourselves. And then many of us spend our years feeling angry and depressed, feeling not good enough because we've bought into the lie that we're supposed to do it by ourselves. We are intended, as it happens in the entire cosmos, to experience fusion. And that is the intermingling, the connecting with others. There's a power that happens when fusion is that which we open our lives to. Aristotle says the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And I don't know about you, but when I look at, hear, read, sense the news today, I'm often thinking of Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light, the season of darkness, the spring of hope, the winter of despair. We had everything before us and nothing. We were all going to heaven or we were all going direct the other way. So many people experience compassion fatigue today. People experience a sense of hopelessness and despair when they hear unheeded effects of global warming, legislative invasion into women's bodies, tumultuous relations between Russia and China and Syria and the European Union and more than 68 million displaced refugees and on and on and on. And you say, Sister Girl, I didn't come to church to hear that. But that's why it's important to know that the same DNA that enables stars to shine as brightly as they do, that same DNA is within you. 
And when, through the process of fusion, you merge your bright light with the light of others, that is how we transform the world. We are star stuff, Carl Sagan says. Rumi says the universe and the light of the stars come through me. See that. Feel it. Hear the angels singing over you. And when I said they sang when you were born, they've not stopped singing. No matter what your journey has looked like, no matter the choices you've made, those places that you feel are successes, those that you think are failures, the angels are still singing over you. If ever there were a time we need a critical mass of people, who know that they are star stuff. Who know that the angels sing over and celebrate and adore them. If ever there were a time, it is now, sisters and brothers. And so I sing this song to you. On a clear day, rise and look around you, and you'll see who you are. On a clear day, how it will astound you that the glow of your being outshines every star. You'll feel part of every mountain, sea, and shore. You can hear from far and near a world you've never heard before. And on a clear day, on that clear day, you can see forever and ever. You are amazing. You are stardust. You are the light of the world. And no one is served by you playing it small. We need you to be your full, authentic, powerful self that is connected with that which created you. We need it. So often people tell me how much my books that I write and my sermons that I preach, how much they bless them. Truth be told, growing up as a dark-skinned, black, working-class, Pentecostal girl from Baltimore. Everything I was taught, I was supposed to play small. I'm not supposed to be here. And so every time someone thanks me for what I write or what I speak and how it blesses them, I'm always reminded that it's in my DNA. And it's in yours. I don't care what the circumstances of your life have been. If some have said you are too young or you're too old or you don't have the right education or what ever pedigree. On a clear day, rise and look and see how awesome you are. And everything
every time you own it. Every time you see it. Every time you celebrate who you are, the unique gifts and experiences and skills, every time you celebrate that, you bless all of us. And so I want to share this other song with you for those of you who might not know the the Lane and Lerner song I just sang. Earth, wind, and fire had a song. You're a shining star, no matter who you are. Shining bright to see who you can truly be. Whatever song you want to sing. And transform the song, this little light of mine, to this big ass light of mine. (laughs) We need you to be still enough to hear the angels singing over you and to join in chorus with them in singing over the lives of others. We need you to be all that God has called and created you to be. You are a shining star. God bless you.